Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to this lightning talk, where hopefully we'll talk about cytoplasmic stress granules and how we can use them to better treat cancer. So to begin, we have to talk about stress granules. And to do that, I want to tell you a little story. So once upon a time, it was thought that the only real structures in the cell, these large membrane-bound organelles, the mitochondria, the Golgi, but it turns out actually that the story is much more complicated than that. Because in the cell, we have lots of different RNA and proteins doing their various jobs. And when the cell experiences stress, it wants to collect all this precious cargo it's after the stress has dissipated. So it collects them into these granules. And granules that come about in the time of stress are not so cleverly called stress granules. These granules have no membrane. So they're held together by really interesting biophysical properties. They, for example, pave like oil droplets on water. And these granules have been linked to many different pathologies. In our study, we looked at cancer cells. And if you think about it, cancer cells are always in a state of stress. They're oxygen deprived, nutrient deprived, lots of overcrowding. So cancer cells have used stress granules in many interesting ways. So this is what stress granules look like. These are immunofluorescent images. We see in our untreated cells, the, these are just three of the many proteins involved in stress granules. They can either be diffused in the nucleus or the cytoplasm. And when we induce stress, in this case, arsenide, a heavy oxidative stress, we see these granules begin to form in the cytoplasm. And for our study, we looked at a chemotherapy known as vinorelbine or VRB. And when we treat our cells with the VRB, again, we see these stress granules begin to form. Now, to make our study a little more clinically relevant, we use a model known as patient-derived organoids. Now, when you grow cells in a monolayer on a plastic dish, so you can get a lot of information from that. But that, of course, isn't how cells grow in the body. Tissues have a 3D structure, which is very important to how they behave. So when we grow our organoids, we use scaffolding and give it a 3D matrix so that the these cells, these organoids, will behave much more like tissues in the body. And when we treated our healthy breast organoids with arsenide, we saw stress granules form nicely in the cytoplasm. But when we treated with, with VRB, the concentration we were used to using, we saw no stress granules form at all. But when we treated our breast cancer organoids, now we all of a sudden started seeing stress granules form in the VRB treatment as well. So this made us ask two questions. Why are the cancer cells behaving differently than the healthy cells. And second of all, can we leverage these stress granules to better treat the cancer? So what we did was we co-treated our chemotherapy with a corticosteroid, in this case, cortisone. And this is something that's done fairly often. What we saw is that when we treat with very low levels of VRB, in this case, 50 micromolar, we saw no stress granules in the cytoplasm. When we added our cortisone, we augmented the treatment with the steroid. Now, all of a sudden, we see a huge abundance of stress granules. But even more interesting is that as you increase the concentration of VRB, we see a huge increase in cell death that we didn't see when you don't treat with the cortisone. So what we're seeing then is that the cortisone augmentation to the chemotherapy is not only enhancing the rate at which the stress granules form, but also increasing the cell death. So we went back to our patient-derived organoid model, and we saw that in healthy tissue, we didn't see any stress granules, both in the VRB or the VRB and cortisone treatment. But when we treated our cancer organoids, with the same treatments, we saw the stress granules begin to form. More importantly, we saw the cell death in the VRB and cortisone treatment. So why was this happening? So to save you guys the long story, we're not gonna go into all the Western plot and all the validation we did with immunofluorescence, but to, to, to sum it down, we see that there are many kinases that are active when stress granules form. VRB is activating one of them. But the cortisone is actually activating a second kinase. And this second kinase is rapidly enhancing the rate of stress granule formation. But more importantly, and something we'll see in a second, is it's also changing the properties of the stress granules. One of the ways we looked at this was rinsing out the treatments. Because of course, when you rinse away the treatment, the stress granules are supposed to dissolve and the cell is meant to return function as normal. And we saw this when, this, when we treated with VRB and rinsed it out. After about 30 minutes, we saw these stress granules disappear. And that's how it stayed through the rest of the treatment. However, when we treated with VRB and cortisone and then tried to rinse out the treatment, we saw the stress granules linger. And this impaired clearance is something that's linked very heavily to many different pathologies. And we see that throughout the entire treatment, the stress granules are still there. And we're able to quantify this, and we see that there's a very quick dissolving when we treat with just VRB. But the VRB and cortisone stress granules, those linger much more. And there's something about the biophysical properties of the stress granule that's changing that's causing this impaired clearance which is very heavily linked to the cell death. So just to go back to what we had seen before, 
we see that by better understanding the molecular mechanisms of the stress cranial formation, we can not only enhance the chemosensitivity of the cancer cells, but hopefully also improve patient outcomes. So thank you very much for listening.